You can't make people become um, different from what they are. You can steer population groups in a certain way. Um, I think our ruling classes have been very successful in doing that since the war. People's attitude. Hmm? The, the war being... Second World War. So we've had a change in our social values in, in the post-war period. Well, for me, it wouldn't be positive, but if I was trying to be unbiased, it's certainly the case you had something called the permissive society in the 1960s. And so that meant it was no longer um, shame in not being married, but having sexual relations or having a child outside of marriage. No longer shameful. And within, within Britain, Britain in the 1940s and early 50s, and throughout the 50s. It didn't actually matter what the churches um, believed because you got through the the leaders of the culture in Britain and elsewhere in the West. That isn't even need, needs to be mentioned. You simply got a, a move of the population um, from a kind of sense of strict morals and and regarding as shameful doing certain things to a, a slackening of, of um, taboos. So we've moved from a situation in the 1940s and 50s to what we have today. Big changes. It didn't require anybody to force anybody physically, but what you did is you take the children, say kids in front of the television in the in the 50s and 60s, and the, the old ones, their, their parents, retain their old values, but the kids who are growing up have new values, and they get it through the rock music as well. And then they have kids, and they have another set of values. population growth through the through up to the 1960s and then um, you begin to you saw the yeah actually what happened is the baby boom went on from 1945 or thereabouts through to 1964 when it ended abruptly and that and it ended probably because more women were, young women were having using uh, the birth control pill which became commonly used from, from the late 50s but I'm saying actually that is part of the issue of the permissive society, the availability of the birth control pill, yeah. plus um, the development of um, rock music, pop music, rock music, yeah. plus, plus, I'm saying, yeah, I agree, it's freedom, you see. So you've got changes in social attitudes, not by coercion, but by steering the population in certain ways, and not actually necessarily changing the, the population that was adults in the late 50s, but changing the young who were born in the, say, the mid, in the early 50s. So, so if you're born in 1950 and you're 20 in 1970, you've been brought up through this permissive society. And that's how the changes happened. Now, they weren't by accident because there were decisions made about what goes on the television, what's produced by Hollywood. Now, in, in Hollywood's very interesting because, you know, you could sit a child in front of a film that was made anywhere up to, say, the mid-1960s, and it would be pretty safe. You'd go and, go and do the washing or make the dinner. But after that date, it was hard to do that because you could not know what they might see. Sexualization. Yeah, and it wasn't an accident, it was not an accident because you had this sexualization in the 20s and 30s in Hollywood. What happened was, in the new, the new talkies, now, what happened was, what? The Hayes Code. Yeah, you got this, the Hayes Code. It was produced by, it, it was at the initiative of mainly a Catholic priest and a Catholic layman, um, who, not just on their own, they had the force of the Catholic Church behind them. And they said, basically, you uh, if you don't clean up Hollywood, then we will encourage Catholics to stop going to the cinema. This was in the 30s during the Great Depression. Hollywood had spent a lot of money investing in the talkies, a lot of technology, 
So they were in debt. Metro Goldwyn Mayer and the others were in debt. So they basically could have the screws put on them by the Catholic Church. Out of it came the production codes. And that meant certain things could not be shown on the cinema. And it lasted until formally until the mid 1960s. Then Hollywood was rich and the Catholic Church was comparatively weak. And so they said, right, that's the end of that. Freedom came in, as you would say. And this. Yeah, this accelerated. Um, freedom from Catholic moral values, yeah. And so freedom comes in and you have much more um, sexual um, ostentation <laughs> in there. Now, we've also got an interesting aspect of this. In about, there was a film, um, oh, yeah, a film actually, something like The People vs. Larry Flint. And uh, Woody Harrelson, I think, played Larry Flint in this. And it was about freedom of expression because I think, the, uh, I think the authorities in America tried to stop um, the uh, pornographic industry, his, his big pornographic empire. Okay, you may, you may know more than I, I just, it's just coming to me now. And, and he, he won the case. Yeah, and the argument was, look, you know, if you don't like porn, don't buy it. And uh, it's like, in the past, if you don't like um, homosexuality on the, on the cinema or on the television, don't watch it. Individualism. Individualism. Well, the interesting thing is today, if somebody wants to put out a video that is, um, how one might say, um, goes against the, the liberal agenda, or they want a movie that might go against the liberal agenda, it's not, nobody's saying, well, look, we're making this because there's freedom to make these things. If you don't like it, don't watch it. No, it's like, you ain't making it. And if you try, we're going to ban you from YouTube or whatever. So. Yeah, but they're the same people. The liberals, the Larry Flint people, the porno, the porno, all these people, they're the same people who in the 70s were saying freedom of speech, freedom of speech. Now, no, because they were, they are though, they are. What they were doing in the 70s was saying, we're going to pretend we believe in freedom of speech so we can have our actual values promoted. Once we've gained the ascendancy, we will, we will actually bare our teeth, like, you know, in the Big Bad Wolf, you know, the Red Riding Hood. Now they show their teeth, what they're really about. They're not grandma. They pretended they were, but they're not. And, and I think people fell for it a lot. No, but I'm saying they are consistent. Yes, they are, because their values were not about freedom of speech. And so they pretended they were. Their true values are actually illiberal. But you know what though, it, 19th century English liberalism was about really having freedom of expression, you know? It was kind of, I mean, I'm no, yeah, but I'm no great fan of, of John Stuart Mill, but the idea that you would be able to express yourself and everybody, and, and, the, and the states may be like a, a neutral referee of competing views. There's a kind of um, a, a fineness about that idea it's so the real reality though was we were never about that it was about competing groups and the state marx was more of it more right i think he said you know the state is a committee for managing the affairs of the bourgeoisie now i don't believe that but it's more true to me than the state as a neutral arbiter i think as a, as a neutral entity yeah and, and I think that what we see today is the state, it's more like um, it responds to, I, I'd say the whole of the West. No, I'm talking actually about um, all of Britain's settler colonies, you know, Australia, New Zealand, the USA, Canada. I'm talking about, and can say Western Europe. All those kind of nations which developed out of, out of this nation, because they're very similar in many ways, and they all seem to be ca characterised by similar features. It is that they, they are very much responsive to the real rulers 
of the nations, those who form opinions. Because if you form an opinion of the masses, the masses then vote. So if, for example, in, if, if, if say for example, in the 1960s, um, you want to promote, um, say, homosexual marriage, well, no way will any politician do that because the population is against it. But that's, it's not that the politicians are in themselves for or against. They just respond into the, the zeitgeist. So if you are in the real, you're amongst the real rulers, you promote um, the idea in the general population that homosexual marriage is a good thing and you get the population to feel that way then you can make the politicians you can, you can make them uh, support it and that's how we've seen Barack Obama's career he was saying initially he's against homosexual marriage he becomes president and he's for it on his part, yes.